Now on the screen will be some scripture I'm gonna use this morning so you can see it. Again, we're in the third week of this four-part series we've called For Such a Time as This, looking at the history of the early church and how that's led us to where we are today. And so this morning, we're gonna, I wanna give us a recap to catch us up to it. We're gonna be in verses 42 through 47 uh, predominantly. If you wanna find your place in Ephesians 4 and Acts chapter 4, we'll get there at some point uh, as well. But let me give you some context to catch us up. Week one, we talked about the power of the church. That Jesus had been crucified, resurrected, ascended into heaven. And as he ascends, he tells his followers, go wait for me in Jerusalem. Just wait and the spirit will come and will come upon you and give you power. And so they're in Jerusalem, they're waiting. And around 50 days after Jesus' death and resurrection, after what was the ancient tradition of Passover, comes what would have been uh, the Feast of the Harvest or the Feast of First Fruits. And now we call it Pentecost, meaning 50th or 50 days. And this is when the Holy Spirit descends upon them, rests on them. The disciples and 120 people begin to speak in other languages. People who have gathered in Jerusalem hear the good news, hear the gospel of Jesus in their language, and they're blown away. And the only way they can explain it is, gosh, they're drunk people. They must be drunk. And Peter's like, it's far too early to be drunk. It's not even the fall yet. It's not Saturday in the fall. We're not drunk that early yet. And so it can't be that. What it is, it's, it's a move of God. And so in that first week, we talked about there's an overlap. There's a place throughout scripture where the sacred uh, meets the secular, where heaven meets earth. And we talked about that in the New Testament, that place was Jesus. And then Jesus gives that place to us as the church. That you and I, when we gather, we are the geography of heaven today. We have gathered here, and there's something sacred that happens when the people of God have gathered. And so we, we are now. We're the intersection of heaven and earth. We're this unique place uh, on the planet where God has made himself known to us, like the burning bush and like the, like the pillar of fire and like the temple and tabernacle, just like that. And then last week, we looked at uh, the people who are, the people of the church, the people who are that place where heaven meets earth, are not perfect people. We are people who are broken, and yet we are repentant people. People who, whom God has met where we are, he's told us the truth about ourselves, and we've responded in repentance. That is who we are, it's what the church is. And after that sermon is where we're gonna pick up here. In Acts chapter two, look at verse 41, just to give us some context. Those who received the word of Peter, the sermon that he gave, sharing the gospel, were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Overnight, uh, within, within the span of a week and a half, we go from 120 people to 3,000 people, which sounds like an awesome thing to write a book about, like a terrible thing to try to figure out logistically as a church, uh, but it's amazing what happens there. And so then the natural question for us then is, well, then what do we do about that? What, what did they do? How did they handle what was happening? What did these 3,000 people do? If this is what's happening, what, did, what is it that they did? And this morning is where we're gonna land here uh, to talk about it. This past week, uh, man, we've had some sickness in our house over the past few months. And so we had a stomach bug go through this week. Anybody else have that stomach bug? Good night. It's no fun. I, I would rather be sick any other way than that. Any other way. I would rather be sick. Started Monday, um, ended sometime yesterday morning, uh, late Friday night for us in our house. And everything was great until mama got sick. And once mama gets sick, the whole house just falls apart. And she took care of us all week long, stocked up everything for us. The moment she got everything cleaned and Lysoled and all the sheets washed, she got sick uh, because she settled down. And so last night, um, yeah, I was gonna make dinner for all of us. We needed something bland. And so I decided I'm gonna make homemade chicken tenders, chicken fingers at home. And I'm not Southern enough to fry them, so I baked them. Uh, I baked these chicken fingers, and I went to find a recipe at the uh, place you go to find recipes, which is Pinterest. If you've ever found a recipe on Pinterest, you understand how it works. You've got a, a title which says, quick 20-minute meal for your family. Have you seen that? <laughs> what that means is it'll take 20 minutes to find the ingredients, and then three and a half hours to make this for your family. And then your family will hate it and you'll never make it again. That, that's what Pinterest stands for. It's what it stands for. If you look in the Greek, that's what it means. So, uh, so I find a recipe for these chicken fingers, and we have all the ingredients, and so you know how it works. At the top, it gives you the ingredient list, and then you gotta scroll for three and a half weeks, and once you get down to the bottom, and you get through all the ads and videos and pictures of people's cats and dogs, and you finally get down there, uh, then it tells you how to make it, then you gotta scroll some more to figure out how long to do it. It's, it's a whole thing. So I'm making it, um, Meredith comes out and she eats with us at the island and so she's uh, eating. She's like, These are really good, she says, which I'm like, yeah, of course they are, I made them, which I, I'm terrible, but they, they turned out okay. And so uh, she says, hey, what's in them? 
Now, I don't know if you have kids like this in your family. Uh, we have one child in particular where we cannot tell him what's in the food, otherwise he will not eat it. If he doesn't know, we'll be fine. But the moment he finds out what's in it, man, it is over for us. And so Meredith, in her sickness, asked the question which she knows not to ask in front of him. And she asked, I'm like, Shh, mm -mm, not now. And so Kaysen picks this up, he's like, what, 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 what did she ask? Nothing, buddy, it's fine, nothing. So Meredith eats and she remembers that I didn't answer the question and so she asked me again. I'm like, baby, listen, I, I know you've been sick but we've been through this for 10 years. You cannot ask me that in front of him. So we eat and Kaysen eats and um, I'm like, okay, I will tell you what's in it. I was like, well, you make this, you make the wash out of eggs and there's a little bit of mayonnaise and you put mustard in it and Kaysen's eyes get gigantic. <laughs> and he was like, you put what in it? He's like, you know I don't like mustard. And I was like, yeah, but you like those chicken fingers. <laughs> but there's something about the, when you realize what's in it, you're like, I don't think I like that. You know what I mean? You know that feeling of like, oh, that was in it? Mm, well, I'm not so sure I'd order that again. You loved it before you knew. Ignorance is bliss often. What's gonna happen here this morning in Acts chapter two is that um, Luke, the author of Acts, is gonna lay out for us the ingredients of the local church. And I want you to know, some of them are gonna taste like mustard to you. And you're gonna be like, you put what in it? There's mustard in my church? Uh-huh, yeah. And some of us aren't gonna like that. But I need you to understand those are the ingredients. And you can't remove an ingredient because then you don't get the full flavor of the church. You don't get the flavor of the feast. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning here in Acts chapter 2. So go with me into Acts chapter 2, verse 42. I'm going to read through these uh, six verses and I'm going to go back into them individually. I want to lay out for you uh, the process or the ingredients. This is how you bake. This is how you cook a church. This is the early church. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and they, so now you're at 3,120 people, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe, wonder, fear came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, Attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So I want to put all this in context back in verse 42. You're going to see how this is all laid out. It's, it's really it's awesome how Luke does this. Let's look back at verse 42. There's a word in here that's going to cause problems for us. And they devoted themselves. So we've got to discuss, first of all, what devotion is. What does it mean to devote ourselves? Because it wasn't just that they practiced, that they engaged in, they dabbled in, they, they tried. No, they devoted. I'm going to give us a working definition for the morning of what devoted is. Devoted, we're going to define it as constantly, consistently attentive to. To be devoted to your spouse is to be constantly, consistently attentive to him or to her. To be devoted to your children, to your job, to your hobby, this is what it means. It means to be constantly and consistently, always and in every way, attentive to is what devoted means. And immediately we have a problem, don't we? Particularly in our culture, devotion is not a thing that our, this generation is known for at all. Devotion is tough for us in 2024. All you have to do is look at college football. The moment you get mad at a coach, you just go to another school. Uh, high school, middle school, thing, all of it. The moment something doesn't go your way, devotion, constant commitment, and attentiveness to something goes out the window and we shift towards something else. So I wanna, I wanna lay this before you. Before, before we step into anything, these, these are the user agreements. The user agreement begins with, will you be devoted to? Constantly, consistently attentive to. And I know, I know that's not the air that we breathe in 2024. We don't breathe the air of devotion. We breathe the air of, of, of the moment, of whatever is fleeting, of our passion today. We breathe the air of whatever makes me happy. We breathe the air of fast food. We don't breathe the air of crockpots anymore. We breathe the air of fast food. And so devotion is going to be tough, but these are the user agreements. You know when you sign up for something and you get a user agreement? Anybody read those? 
you just scroll to the bottom like I do, and then you check the box, and then you, you sign for it. That, that's what I do. All right, these, these are the agreements. So when you got married, uh, you stood before a crowd of people, before God and before these witnesses. And I don't know that you heard the words you said to your spouse, because the words went something like, in richer, or for richer, for poorer, in sickness, and in health. Those, those are the words. But what you heard was, when I'm rich, when I'm healthy, while you're still skinny, that's what you heard. And then, when all hell breaks loose, you need to remember, you signed off on, no, 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 you signed off on in sickness. You signed off on for poorer. You signed off on 120 pounds later. You signed off on that. You did, you agreed to that. So the early church begins with devotion. I need you to know what we're getting ourselves into. The early church was devoted, constantly, consistently devoted to. And what was it? Well, Luke gives us the first thing in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching. So I'm gonna summarize it this way, just for sake of time. This is, uh, this is how we're gonna define it. A church is devoted to learning. This is how we're gonna define devoted to the apostles' teaching. We're gonna call it learning. And I've already lost half of you because you graduated high school or didn't a number of years ago. And all the learning stopped then, didn't it? That, you stopped learning at that point. You had all you needed to know, and so you've, you've completely abandoned learning. But I need you, I need you to come back in for a second because the question is, well, what were they learning? Well, Luke tells us it was the apostles' teaching, which then the question is, what were the apostles' teaching? What was their doctrine? Was it the gospel? Was it that Jesus lived, died, resurrected, and ascended? Yeah, uh-huh. that was part of it. Was it a fact? Was it apologetics? Was, were they learning how to vote, how to have a successful marriage? Were they learning these things? Here's, here's what they were learning. They were learning a brand new way to live, a new way of life. You've got to understand for the early church how countercultural the way of Jesus was. It went against everything that they thought they knew. Now, obviously, it was counter-Rome, it's counter-society, it's obviously different than that. But remember who's in the group now. These 3,000 people are devout Jews who have gathered for the feast of the first fruits for Pentecost. The way of Jesus was also counter-Jerusalem. Not just Rome, but Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem has started to breathe the air of Rome. We're going through Matthew. Remember when Jesus enters Jerusalem, he doesn't, he doesn't go to Caesar. He doesn't go to Herod. He goes to the temple and flips over tables. So what, Jesus, what the apostles are teaching them is this way of Jesus, this whole new way of living. It's countercultural. It's not unlike anything they had ever seen before. And so once their eyes were opened through Peter's sermon, oh, that was Jesus? That was the Messiah? Now the response is, well, then what do we do about it? Remember, Peter's response was, oh, brothers, you gotta repent. You gotta turn from that old way of life and begin to walk in the way of Jesus. So they were constantly, consistently devoted to this. They were devoted to the way of Jesus. Hundreds of years later, um, there's more churches starting. And one church in particular is in, the, in uh, an area of Ephesus. And Paul has launched this church, different sermon for a different time. But he launches, plants this church in Ephesus. And they're asking similar questions. And here's how Paul handles it. Here's Ephesians chapter four, beginning in verse 17, because there's similar things happening here in Ephesus. Paul says, now this I say, I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles, the non-Jews do, in the futility of their minds. Not in the futility of their hearts or their souls or their actions. Their minds are futile. No longer live like they do because of, of the futility or the emptiness of their minds. He continues, they're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness, their hardness of heart. They become callous. They've given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to every practice, practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. He continues, that is assuming you have heard about him and you were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. And here's what they were taught. So what were they taught? The apostles teaching, here's what they were taught in verse 22. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and instead to be renewed in the spirit of what? Your minds. 
And I know I've lost a lot of you because church is the place you don't have to use your mind anymore. You can just use your heart. You can just feel things. And then you can go do things that you feel. I'm telling you, the first ingredient of the church is learning with your mind. So Paul would say we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, not the renewing of your heart, not the renewing of your behavior, by the renewing of your mind. Get a whole new mindset about the world. And he continues, and verse 24, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. So what is it that they were learning? Well, to riff off of an old Switchfoot song, they were learning a new way to be human. That's what they were learning a new way to be human. So what is a church? A church is a people continually committed to learning a new way to be human. You understand we never outgrow this. And if you're like me, you've learned the older you get, it's actually harder to be like Jesus. The more your flesh starts to reveal itself. You thought it was bad when you were in high school and then you had high schoolers and you realize, well, I'm so far from how Jesus would handle this. We're never too far to not continue to learn a new way to be human. It's, it's not the air we breathe. The way of Jesus is not the way the culture is telling us to live. There's something completely countercultural. So they're constantly, continually committed to this, to learning a new way to be human. Now, we talked about internet recipes before. And so, you know, you've got the ingredient list at the top and you still don't know how to use the ingredients and so you've got to scroll and scroll and scroll. And after you get carpal tunnel, or carpal tunnel syndrome, you finally find it. And then that's where it tells you how to use what it is they told you to do. Well, Luke is similar, but you don't have to scroll for him. So verse 42 is the outline of this entire passage. He lists four things. And then if you're paying attention, he tells you what those four things mean in the following verses. So we're looking for keywords. Verse 42, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. And look what you find in verse 43. All came upon every soul. Many and wonders and signs were being done through whom? The apostles. Yes. So let's connect it. Teaching of the apostles turns into wonders and signs, miraculous things being done by the apostles. So here's, here's what we're learning. This teaching wasn't just in word, but it was in deed. And it was creating a buzz. Something was happening with them learning a new way of life. They were actually seeing it put on display and things were happening. Let's continue back into verse 42. So they were devoted to teaching. What else? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to learning and the fellowship. Now, you Lord of the Rings fans, you know exactly what he's talking about. I devoted yourself to the fellowship. I see you, Justin. Yeah, I knew you would. Yep, uh, the fellowship. But it's a, it's a very churchy word and... Uh, Unless, unless you're in that world. It's very churchy, right? Uh, at your workplace, do you go to eat at the fellowship hall? Is that where you go? Like you get a break. Let's all go to the fellowship hall. That's not where you go. Uh, you're not really, you don't fellowship with your travel ball team. Man, we had a great weekend of fellowship with our, with our U4 travel baseball team. It was wonderful. We paid $3 million to play in this tournament and my three-year-old's gonna be an, a pro one day and the fellowship was amazing. You don't do that. We don't, we don't fellowship at school. It's a very churchy, churchy idea. But for us Christians, we hear it and we think of fellowship halls. We think of potluck dinners. We think of covered dishes. That's what we think. We think of hanging out together. And it kind of is, uh, but it's more than that. Um, you uh, who have been Christians since the 70s will know this word. The word for fellowship in the Greek is the word koinonia. Anybody remember that word, koinonia? You have it engraved somewhere in your house. Uh, so koinonia, the word we translate is is fellowship. I used to think it was cornucopia, which made Thanksgiving confusing for me. I couldn't quite understand why we were putting koinonias everywhere. Uh, but that's just a church kid trying to figure out language. So koinonia, the idea is, is fellowship. So yes, it is hanging out together, uh, but it's deeper than that. So the question then is, well, what, is, what does koinonia mean? And Luke's like, well, I'm going to tell you. Just pay attention. Go down to verse uh, 44. We're looking for key words that connect us. Learning for the apostles, we saw that in 43. Here's 44. All who believed, 3,120 people were together and had all things in common. The word fellowship is koinonia. The word common is koine, the same root word. They had all things in koine. 
They koinoniaed, and they had all things in koine. So what does it mean to have all things in common? Well, Luke's like, give me time. I'll answer the question. Look at verse 45. To have all things in common means they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. So one way for us to define or describe fellowship koinonia would be sharing. What is koinonia? They devoted themselves constantly, continually, attentive to sharing with one another, which sounds different than hanging out, doesn't it? Feels a bit more intense. Feels a bit more like mustard in your chicken finger. It's what it feels like. They were sharing. But it's even deeper than that. So sharing is one way to describe it, but it's, it's more full and rich than that. A month or so, two months later, and we read in Acts chapter four, this early church is still growing and thriving. And so we've got some more expression. Look at Acts 4, verse 32. It'll be on the screen or you can turn there. Luke tells us the full number of those thousands of people who believed were of one heart and soul. And that's a miracle in and of itself, isn't it? That thousands of people agreed on something. There's 400 of you here and you don't agree on anything. Thousands of people, one heart and one soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in koine, in common. Do you see it? We're, be, we're being taught what koinonia means. They were of one heart, one soul. They agreed on things. So yes, it's sharing, but also it's unity. Not sharing the way your toddlers share with each other because you told them to, but sharing because they want to. Sharing because they see themselves as one. They had one common heart, one common mind, one common purpose. They had been so transformed by the teaching of the apostles that they had stopped breathing the air of culture and consumerism and instead had started breathing the air of Jesus, which was generosity. And they loved each other so much. They had so much in common that they actually shared with each other. And look what happens in verse 33. With great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, the apostles' teaching, and great grace was upon them all. And there was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and lay at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. And before you start freaking out that I'm gonna teach uh, communism or socialism, the Bible doesn't teach that. This is not a forced thing where everyone's in even playing field. Pay attention. Look what he's saying. Those who owned, those who had excess, they had been taught a brand new way to be human. And what was acquire, acquire, acquire. You don't need that land, but I can afford it, so I'm going to buy it. Then I'll build, uh, I'll build silos on it and farms. I'll be able to have this home and that home and that home. Instead of that, they recognize, goodness gracious, I don't need all this land. And I've got a brother who's homeless. How can I help? Oh, I know. I've got this extra thing that I can sell because I'm so of one mind. I so cared so deeply about my brother. I will sell what is mine, give it to the apostles, and they'll distribute it to him to help him. It's not communism. It's gospelism. It's churchism. It's a whole new way to think. We've gotten stuck in these political things for so long that for many of us, any expression of generosity sounds like the other party and we scoff at it. But what if it sounds like Jesus? What if this actually sounds like the way of Jesus? That you don't need all the things that you have. Having younger kids in the house and especially our daughter, um, Landry, one of her favorite things to do is to steal my food and to steal my drink. Since she, was, since she could crawl, I'm a snacker. Gosh, I love to snack. So she would hear the bag of pretzels or whatever it is, and she would come like a gremlin, man. She would come out of nowhere and snuggle up next to me and give me those blue eyes. I'm like, Daddy, okay, here. And then she'd eat some and she'd take a sip out of my drink, and I'd be like, you can have the drink now. I don't want that back. <laughs> I don't want that in common with me. You can have that. <laughs> but if there was an extra, right? Like I, I'm, I'm sharing. So that's what this is teaching. The idea of koinonia is the idea of, gosh, I'm so love, I so love you. I so care about you that I don't see my possessions as mine to acquire. I don't see financial stability or success or independence as a thing to achieve while you're struggling to make ends meet. 
That's what koinonia is. Then I want you to think about that it wasn't just financial. Think about uh, the gifts that had to be used, the, the way of thinking. Everything shifted for them. And then think about how many people had to come alongside to help administer all of that. Like, how do you, how do you handle thousands of people with needs and thousands more people trying to meet those needs? Well, that happens in Acts chapter six with deacons. That's a different sermon for a different day. So what is a church? Well, a church is people continually committed to sharing with one another, sharing life with one another, sharing their possessions and belongings. They're so radically transformed by learning the way of Jesus that they can't help but to share with one another. So they're devoted to the apostles' teaching, devoted to the fellowship. Let's go back to verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Now, the breaking of bread, not breaking bad, that's a different thing. Uh, The breaking of bread, uh, it can refer to what we would call communion or the Lord's Supper, uh, the breaking of bread. But it can also refer to just a common meal, to break bread with one another. It would be a a euphemism for having a meal together. And so this this is probably what's happening here, but I want to show you why I believe that because Luke's going to tell us what he means in verse 46. Day by day, attending the temple, because they still did that as as Jews, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous, which which sounds like a meal, doesn't it? It sounds like like a meal. It's it's multi-layered, and it causes confusion for us because that's not how they would have done communion or the Lord's Supper. It's not the way that we do it today. We are are gifted today uh, with a stale cracker and watered-down grape juice. That's how we do it or fermented, depending on which cup you get. Uh, you, that, that's how we do communion, right? So, so you read, well, they devote themselves to breaking of bread. You think of a five-minute ritual they do once a quarter, right? So that's the breaking of bread is communion. That's not what's happening here in the early church. You gotta think about the early church. They weren't building buildings. They were on the run from the authorities. So not putting out signs saying, hey, here's where the church meets. It took us 200 years to get a sign. They would have never had a sign uh, there. And so they're not building buildings. Where are they meeting? They're meeting in secret and they're meeting in homes. And so they're gathering. They're doing their Jewish thing, which is still allowed. But then they're coming back and they're having meals together. And this meal over time would come to be called the agape feast or a love feast. The host would cook probably the primary part of the meal. Everybody would bring something. They'd have their own uh, potluck dinner, and they, they would feast together. They would be singing. They'd sing some psalms. They'd read from the scriptures. But this all centered around a table. The gravity, the center of gravity for the early church was the dining room table in a home. That's where the church met. It's where they gathered. And that's what we're learning here. They, they and, intentionally, constantly, continually gathered together. There's no church buildings they met in homes. So there would be bread and there would be wine, but there would be so much more. And they would do it in remembrance of Jesus. This is what communion would have looked like. So the problem for us is, well, we think of breaking bread or communion, again, as that stale cracker and watered down grape juice, and we're okay with that. Like, we, we like that. It's, we feel like that's easier than actually communing with one another. Because you can do your five-minute thing every three months, and it doesn't really sh- uh, shape, shape or shift your schedule at all. But this changes everything for us. You and I would rather do communion than actually commune. Do you see it? In 2024, the air we breathe is faster, easier, and more efficient. This kind of being together is anything but that. Let me give you a few statistics just in our day and age. Recent statistics tell us that we eat one out of every five meals in our car. One one out of four of us eat at least one fast food meal every single day. U.S. households spend roughly the same amount per week on fast food as they do on groceries. Listen to this. 60 years ago, the average length of time for a meal, for dinner time, was 90 minutes. Today, it's less than 12. That is when we eat together, which is becoming less and less frequently. The majority of U.S. families report eating a single meal together, just one single meal together, less than five days a week, and four of those times is in front of the TV. 
Leonard Sweet, a theologian, thinker, wrote a book called From Tablet to Table, talking about uh, the law and how it made its way into the early church. And he talks about our culture. So it's a long quote. I'm going to read it. It'll be on the screen for you. We are part of a gourmet gospel, which I love that, a gourmet gospel. He just finished talking about how Jesus uses food to talk about following him, that defines itself in terms of food and table. And yet we find ourselves at a juncture in history where we have lost the table and reduced our food to non-foods. Instead of setting another plate at the table and passing the food, we pass another program or we pass another resolution or pass another law. Then he says, an untabled faith is an unstable faith. A neglect of the table, gathering around the table in our churches, is echoed in our families and our communities. He makes this statement, the table is necessarily communal. You throw in social media and online video games. I'm blown away. I love you guys. When I was in high school, all I wanted to do was to be with my friends, like physically be with them, be playing whatever sport we were playing at the time, to be doing whatever it was. And even if we were playing video games, we had to be in the same room on the same box TV, really close because the cord didn't reach very far away. And so we played video games together. We were literally touching each other together. That's how we played video games. Now, uh, our culture today is you can play video games from another country and say you're together. And so the substitution of actually being together is being virtually together, and we've lost it, man. We've lost the joy of actually being together. And we're seeing it impact our student ministries. We're seeing it impact our schools. And don't think you 40-year-old men are out, out of the equation either. You guys playing Call of Duty at three in the morning with your friends? They're 14, bro. That's, that's for a different time. <laughs> but what the church does is that we get together. A church is a people continually committed to being with one another, actually being with one another. I mean, you remember 2020, don't you? And we consumed church, but we were never actually together together. And what a joy it was to be back six feet apart, but to be back together. This is what the church does. We don't gather online. We gather in person. I've already lost some of you. You were with me at the learning part. You like that. Uh, you're like, yeah, I come for, I've come for that. I come to learn. And even the sharing part, you're like, yeah, I mean, I don't really share a lot, but you're right. We should teach more on tithing. So I'm, I'm with you there. And now I'm like, you should be together. You're like, oh, come on, bro. Don't. I'll put that mustard in my chicken finger. I'm doing fine with the other ingredients. Well, let's keep going. Back to verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and finally, the prayers. Well, that sounds logical because they're a church, right? And it is. It's completely logical that when the church gathers, we should be constantly, continually attentive to prayer. And Luke's going to give us more explanation Explanation in verse 47. What does he mean by prayer? He means praising God, having favor with all the people. So we're going to connect the two. My translation says the prayers. It's plural, prayers. So it probably isn't a general prayer. It probably refers to prayers they had learned and were practicing, prayers they had continued to recite. Even the sermon of the prayer Jesus gives them, maybe that prayer. But more likely, it was the Psalms that they gathered together to sing and to say the psalms together. We would call that worship. So a church then is a people continually committed to worship. So in summary, the ingredients of this early church, to build a church, to bake a church, to cook a church, how do you do it? It's four main ingredients, learning, sharing, being together, and worship. But I'm telling you, it has to have all four. To leave an ingredient out uh, doesn't give you the full flavor. It doesn't give you the full taste of what the church is. So many of us, right, we think of the church as learning. 
And so you come to church to be taught and you come with a great attitude, with a great heart. You're ready to learn. You've got your pens and you've got your highlighters. You've got a journal or four of them. Uh, and then you've got a Bible, like an actual one that you, turn, you touch and you turn pages with and you can write in it and you're, you're coming to learn. You're ready here uh, to learn. You put up with the music. You just wanna get to the part where you can learn. But I'm not even done with the benediction and you're already in your car in the parking lot. Like I know when, when I wrap up and I begin to give an invitation, you start packing your stuff up, putting your highlighters back in your container and then you put it back in your bag and you start moonwalking back to the door. Like you're done. Like you've, you've hit your limit. I think a lot of us would like to just do that. We're just here to learn. Tell me something I can uh, tell my Christian friends about that'll make me sound smart and wise. Give me a new way of thinking about that passage. And then I'll think about it and then I'll come back the next week. Some of us, we think of the church as worship. So you come ready to sing, and you're ready to pray, and you're, you have a great heart, you've got expressive worship, your hands are raised, and then I start teaching, and your blanks start getting longer, and you fall asleep. Listen, I need you to know that I see you. You need to know that, that I see you. <laughs> And it offends me, that not, not, but it, I, I see it happening. You're, you're not here to be challenged or to be taught. You're here for the emotion of all of it. And maybe you don't fall asleep, but um, you go to get coffee, and then you go back to get more coffee, and then more. Or, good gracious, how many times you go to the restroom during a 45-minute sermon? You need to see a doctor. <laughs> I, I mean, I love you, but there's, medically, that should not be happening. So maybe church is just learning or it's a place to come and to worship, to get that emotional fix. Many of us, I think we'd combine the two. We'd take the first and the fourth. Like, yeah, that's what church is. We call it a day. It checks the boxes. We feel good about ourselves. We did the thing. Now we can impress other people. But to ask you to share your life with someone, to share your gifts, your time, your struggles, your wisdom, your experience, it's just too much for you. You can handle the, hey, how you doing? Are you working, are you working hard or hardly working? You can do all that. But like actual conversation with people, you just can't do it. It's too much for you. And I know some of us are introverts, and so that I get it. Listen, I get it. And I'm not telling you to be friends with 400 people. I'm not telling you that. I'm not even telling you to get in a small group. I'm just telling you to have your heart open to actually investing in other people, to actually do that. Because what's underneath that, we can, call, we can call it, I'm just an introvert, but here's what I think is actually underneath it, is insecurity, but I think more importantly, it's arrogance. You think you're better than the rest of these people. So you got your teaching, and you got your singing, and now you're going to go be with the rest of the smart people, the people who have it figured out. That's arrogant. That you're too busy, your time is not, people are not important enough for your time. That's, that's what that communicates. You can consume one and four online all you want, but that's not the church. You can get all kinds of podcasts of better preachers, I'm telling you, much better preachers and teachers than me. You can listen to music that's not as good as ours. You can do all that if you want to, but that's not being part of a church. It's not being the bride of Christ. Now, before all you relational extroverts get happy because I'm slamming everybody else, it's your turn. <laughs> Some of us think the church is here just to help us build our social network. But you know, like in a Christian way. Like you're not gonna go to the bar, so you just go to church. You're not gonna get on like online chats and stuff, but you'll come here. You're gonna figure out how to fill your schedule with activities and how to do things and how to make friends and how to meet people. And then when you don't, you blame the church for it? Like, it's, like we're a matchmaking service for you? Like I'm supposed to help you make friends. So that, that's what church is for you. It's a place to come and to be, to be social, to come and to hang out. You actually have no interest in learning about Jesus or following his way. You just wanna meet people. Or you've already met people and now you wanna come back and hang out with that same group of people because you love it. And so small group is a good time to hang out. It's a good time to, you know, uh, shoot the breeze, 
get to talk about sports and, and politics or whatever else. And you're not interested in learning about Jesus. You're actually interested in something altogether different than that. You're not interested in actually laying down your life for other people. You want other people to meet your, your needs. So maybe you serve on teams, but you pick the teams that keep you from having to sit through a service or that keep you from having to be in a small group. You actually spend more time in the lobby than you do in your seat. Is that too far? You'd rather sit and drink coffee than to come and actually participate in the worship gathering. We're here for that. It fills your tank, but you have no interest in actually worshiping the king of the universe. So you write the check, you go to small group, and then you even go to lunch afterward with these people. You're like, bro, I'm doing all of it. I'm doing all the things. But when it comes to actually walking in repentance and allowing yourself to be shaped and formed by the word of God, you always have ways to deflect or to be busy or to blame other people for your shortcomings. And I'm telling you, man, you're missing the ingredients of the full flavor of the church. The beauty of the church and the feast that she is is best made with all the ingredients. And yes, some of them taste like mustard. And you don't like mustard. And then you leave like, oh, I got a bad taste in my mouth. It's because you didn't have all the ingredients. You want to know why church gives you a bad taste in your mouth? Because you've got two of the four. So of course it tastes awful. You've got three of the four. One of the, yes, you have a bad taste in your mouth. Yes, you think church is too critical or too ritualistic or too old-fashioned because you're not experiencing all the flavor. Of course you think it's just for old people or it's not sophisticated enough or it's not smart enough for people like you. Yes, because you have not experienced the full flavor of the church. The bad taste in your mouth didn't come from Jesus. It came because you left an ingredient out. And you're not experiencing the flavor of the church, the real thing. So I want, you to sh- I want to show you. Here's what happens when the church has all the ingredients. Here's Acts 2, 47. That the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Go back to the ingredients. Do you see a revival service? Do you see evangelism classes? Do you see visitation? All good things, but do you see them? No. All you see is the church being the church, the full-flavored church, the place where the sacred meets the secular, where heaven invades the kingdom of this world. And when that happens, look at verse 47. Day by day, people are getting saved. Just because they're doing what they're supposed to be doing in devotion, constantly, continually, learning a new way to live this life sharing in unity with one another, actually being together and worshiping the King of kings and Lord of lords. A couple of uh, weeks ago, I got a phone call, and I don't get these very often. Daryl often gets more of these, but I got a phone call, and um, the man said, hey, I heard something. Can you tell me? I heard about this need. Um, Can you tell me more about it? I mean, I could, but I in my mind, I was like, no, it's, I think the need's already been met. It's not, that, it's not that big of a deal is how I felt. It's not that big of a deal. They can handle it. And the man on the phone was like, no, no, listen, God won't get off my back about it. Like, it's been a week or so, and I can't get it off my mind. Can you just dig in and find out some more information? I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'll do it, you know, not expecting much. So I send a few texts, make a few phone calls, come to find out there is some need. And so I go back to the guy. I'm like, okay, here's what I found out. He's like, awesome. I'm gonna take care of it. I'm like, all of it? He's like, "Uh uh-huh, all of it. All right, bro. So he does. He figures out a way to anonymously get it where it needs to go. And then um, the next day, I get a text from the person who had this need. And I wanna read you the text from this. This is in our church. I'm gonna read you the text from this person because I think it's significant. They say, I just wanna let you know how much of a blessing it was, and it was truly an answered prayer. Not an answered prayer due to me asking God to help me through the situation I was in, but a constant prayer of humility and begging God to open my eyes. You see, throughout the past six months or so, I haven't been able to see God working in my life. Just felt so out of touch. I felt overlooked and angry at him. So I started off this year praying for God to show me that he provides. If he needed to wreck me literally and strip away whatever he needed to in order to wake me up. That's what he did been trying so hard these past few months to take control over my life and not rely on him. 
but throughout the whole situation of what normally would have been a nightmare for me has just been the most beautiful display of God's grace, power, and love. Please let whoever know, whoever it was that wanted to help me out, know this, that it was God working through them in a way they may or may not have known. I've finally been able to see God show up for me, and he's gotten me back on track through this. I thank God for this before anyone else, but I also want you to thank them for me. What was a tangible need was actually a spiritual need underneath that. And there was someone who had been so enraptured by the teaching of the apostles, of this new way of life that what is mine is not mine, it's actually for everyone, it's for whoever would need it. I've got excess, they've got a need, maybe I can help with my excess. And they happen to be in the right place at the right time, you know how coincidences are. And they hear this and then so in tune to the spirit that the spirit won't get off their back about it. And they respond in a way they thought was just financial, come to find out. It helped this person find their way back to God again. So I get the text and I begin to cry. Then I send a text to the first guy. Hey, listen, here's here's what happened. You need to know. I want you to know. Here's, Here's what happened. And the response from that guy was, wow, that is so awesome. Praise God. Funny how he always puts us in just the right place at just the right time. Had I not been where I was the other day, which was a Sunday here at church, I would not have overheard it. I wouldn't have known anything about it. And he finishes his text with, for such a time as this. So when I say church, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm inviting you into. When you're with people, you actually hear things. And when you hear things through the light of a new mind, a renewed mind of what's, what's mine is his, I can share it. When you hear through all of that, you get to be a part of that joy. You get to be part of it. And it may not be financial. It might be you hear of a need and you can serve in this place or do this thing or create this thing or just pray, but you get to be a witness of that. When people get baptized, Many of you have been praying for that person to get baptized because you know of their story, you know of their struggle. And then when it happens, you feel that same joy that they feel when they come out of the water. This is what I'm talking about. A people who are continually committed to learning a new way to be human, committed to sharing with each other, to being within each other, and to worship. So I texted back uh, the person with the need, hey man, can I share that story on Sunday? And almost immediately, I get this text back. He says, of course, God didn't do that just for me. Amen? It wasn't just for him. That's the story of the gospel through the local church, the tangible expression of where heaven meets earth. And I'm inviting you into the full flavor of it. And you don't get to leave ingredients out because then you don't get the full taste. So we're a people who are going to be devoted to this, to learning, to sharing, to being with each other, and to worshiping the one true God, constantly and continually paying attention to it. It's what makes us a church. It's what makes us different from a Rotary Club or Kiwanis or the Elk Lodge or your travel ball team. It's what makes us di- distinct are these ingredients. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as we finish up this morning? I don't know where you find yourself today, but I know enough to know this. Some of us in the room today have had a bad taste in our mouths, and I need to let you know it's not because the chef messed up, it's because you've left an ingredient out. So of those four, I'd just love for you to take a second and just think and process through these four. Learning a new way to be human. Have you stopped learning? Have you stopped opening your mind to being renewed day by day? And instead, are you just emotional? Are you tossed to and fro? Are you devoting yourself to sharing with one another? To actually meeting needs of other people? Using what you've been given in excess uh, to meet the lack for somebody else? Are you willing to? 
or are you too busy trying to acquire for yourself? That's the air of the culture, not the air of the church. Maybe it's the third ingredient of actually being together. Because in your mind right now, you're already in the parking lot on the way to lunch. Which is fine. I'm just asking you to take somebody with you this time. Or is it the fourth of worship, of actually coming to commune with the Father? So sure, you'll learn and you'll go and you'll uh, be with people. You'll even sit in a small group or a D group and do all those things. But man, when it comes to actually giving him worth, he's not worth it to you. Christians, the mark of a follower of Jesus is not perfection. It's his continual habit of confession and repentance. Where do you need to confess today? What's the mustard in your chicken finger? And then the call is repentance towards constant, continual attentiveness to this thing. And I promise you, it's gonna taste better. You're gonna find the flavor again. But this whole thing started by a man, the son of God, who lived a perfect life and gave his life up for us that we might actually have life, have a shot at this. And this Jesus come to rescue and redeem those of us who are far from him. So maybe today your first step into the church is to receive Jesus as your savior. And then to step into community with people who are trying to do the same thing together. I invite you to that also this morning. Father, we, um, we're not good at this. It goes against so much of our flesh and our natural wiring uh, to be a part of something like this. And yet, uh, you continue to call us to it. And you don't give up. And the beauty is you've given us your spirit to help accomplish it. And your spirit has moved into our hearts and is taking up residence and moving furniture around and we don't like it. And so we try to rearrange back to the way it was before. That's the air of our culture. That's the air we breathe. It's not the air of of the gospel in the air of the church. God, help us to breathe that in deeply today. It's a new way to be human. It's a new way to think about people, a new way to think about money, a new way to think about sex and relationships, a new way to think about forgiveness, a new way to think about um, friendship. So saturate us in it today, God. Give us the full flavor. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen.